Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In chapters 16, 17, and 18 of his Treatise on Virtues and Vices, Alcuin of York is going to discuss three important, if not virtues themselves, certainly actions or courses of action that are expressive of virtue and that play a role in combating against three of the capital vices. And so these are fasting, uh, almsgiving, and chastity. And if you think about it, so fasting is opposing the vice of gluttony and chastity, clearly opposing the, the vice of lust or fornication. What is almsgiving opposing? It's not a corporeal vice, rather it's a spiritual one. It opposes greed. And so each of these is opposing one of the first three of the capital vices. And he says something very interesting in chapter 17 about almsgiving. He tells us that almsgiving and fasting have a particular connection with prayer and intercession. And this is, you know, not just a typical medieval Christian point of view. We can find this in a number of other spiritual traditions as well. And he says intercession for sins is most effectual in almsgiving and fastings. And the prayer raised up from such decisions ascends quickly to divine ears. Since it is written, and here he's going to cite Proverbs, a merciful man benefits his soul. And so there's a lot of discussion in there about what is it that doing these physical things, how do they affect our spiritual condition? So if we look first at fasting, fasting is the reduction or the um, you know, limitation or abstention from eating and drinking. And it, it could you know, apply to eating and drinking um, just normal food. We could also think about you know, abstaining from drinking wine or other intoxicants. Uh, the Latin word for it is eunium. And so this chapter is about that. And he says that, and this is a very, very important point, it is perfected by alms and prayer. So just like with these others, just by themselves, they're not as effective. They're not as perfect in the sense of brought to their, their fulfillment. They're not doing their function. This is not about like dieting. It's not just about, you know, subordinating the body to the mind and being, you know, harsh with yourself. It's supposed to be helping you out as a human being to go in the right way. And so he says that, through it, a human is made spiritual, is joined with the angels and united freely with God. That joined with the angels is also something he's going to say about, about charity, or I mean chastity rather. And so, you know, the notion here is that this helps to prepare us for being part of a divine commonwealth. And, you know, he goes on and he uses some examples here about Adam and uh, Christ as well. But what's important here is that fasting helps to keep the body or the flesh in check because it has a tendency to get out of whack for desires to be too strong or to open the door, as he says, you know, to demons, right? And so it's supposed to strengthen us, not so much in our body, but in our heart, the metaphorical heart that is the core of the human being, or in the soul. And he says something really, really important here as well. If you want your fasting to be good, 
to actually do anything, to not be like the fasting that the demons are capable of. You need not just to abstain from food, but from bad deeds, from doing bad things. Fasting by itself, just simply withholding food from oneself, is not intrinsically good. It becomes good within a context, and then it can have its uh, function made. He says, those who abstain from food and do evilly imitate demons, for whom there's no carnal food and spiritual wickedness is always inside. It's better to renew the mind going to conquer in perpetuity with the food of holy preaching and the food of the word of God than to satiate the belly of death bringing flesh with earthly bread and delicious dishes. <laughs> delicious dishes is how the chapter ends, right? And then we have almsgiving in the next chapter. Eleomosinma. And this actually comes from the Greek word for pity or mercy. Like, you know, during the um, uh, liturgy, when there's, you know, um, this, you know, have mercy on us, Lord, that word is actually being invoked there. So almsgiving is not just like throwing money around because you want to be a big shot. That'd be actually vainglorious. It's not just, um, you know, some sort of requirement of justice. It's going beyond that but it does have a connection with justice. It's a way in which a human being can be part of something bigger than themselves. And he sums it up by calling it providing for the wants of others from the abundance, not just the abundance that you have, but the abundance that God has given. So he says, there's, there's very many who have no share in fields, none in vineyards, none in the riches of the world whose wants we ought to provide for so that they also with us may bless the Lord for the fecundity of the earth and rejoice that there are gifts from those possessing things, which have also been made common to the poor and to pilgrims. Now, this, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. So the poor, those who don't have the resources that others do, but also pilgrims, those who are traveling and need to be helped out. We might think of refugees as being in both cases, right? And so what does this actually do? Like he says, um, th this allows them to bless the Lord for the fecundity of the earth, the fruitfulness of the earth, because people are sharing that fruitfulness with them rather than saying, go get a job, you know, or withholding it or saying, get out of here. We don't like you in our neighborhood. So that's, that's very important. And he tells us in a number of different ways here that there's a kind of uh, recompense that is being promised, you know, so you should be good to those in this world, not just so they'll pay you back in this world, but so that um, you'll be recompensed in the next world. As a matter of fact, there's a beautiful, beautiful verse in there where he talks about giving and, you know, what you put in the purse of the poor man is praying for you, right? Um, that is, is a wonderful way of thinking about it. What are you actually getting though? What is, is it? Well, you know, you've got riches here. Don't heap them up, heap up riches in heaven. Is it like a whole bunch of banknotes or gold bars or houses or, you know, uh, exercise machines, yachts, whatever it's going to be. No, he, he says that what you're actually going to get is mercy, mercy towards yourself, right? Be merciful and you'll, mercy will be shown you and forgiveness of your sins for the bad stuff that you've actually managed to do yourself, right? So by dis distributing alms to um, the poor, you're actually laying up something for yourself. And he says... Don't fear expense. Don't sigh about your doubtful yield. Your substance when expended well is augmented. Your rewarder wants you to be generous. So it's participating in an economy of generosity by engaging in almsgiving. Towards the very end, he says, there's actually three different ways in which we can give alms. This is very, very interesting, right? So one is by... Uh, corporeal giving to another person. It could be giving them food. It could be 
um, giving them a ride somewhere where they need it. It could be burying the dead. It could be all these sorts of things that we do that are sometimes called the corporal works of mercy. But it can also be forgiving. This is a spiritual way of giving alms. Those who need forgiveness from us and who are actually asking for forgiveness, we can distribute alms by giving them the forgiveness that they are asking us for. The third is, he says, to correct the delinquent and lead the erring back into the way of truth. So teaching, correction, admonition, exhortation, those might also be forms of almsgiving. Now, if you're kind of a self-righteous jerk, you probably should avoid that one. Focus on the forgiving and the giving aspects. But, you know, for some people, uh, particularly if they don't have an awful lot of money, saying the right thing at the right time to the person who needs it could be quite good. You know, I'm reminded of uh, uh, Antonin Sertillage's when he, uh, his response when asked, who is my neighbor? And he says, as a, you know, somebody who's intellectually working, it's whoever is in need of truth. And so that could be a, a form of almsgiving. Uh, the next chapter, chapter 18, another long one is about chastity. And he's going to say unequivocally, unequivocally, this is very interesting. Chastity is an angelic life. He doesn't say, eh, it's kind of like being an angel. It's, it's being with the angels, even though you're not an angel. He says, this is an angelic life. So he doesn't cut any, any corners there. And he's you know, thinking perhaps about the life of a monk, uh, which is what he is. He says, those who live in chastity have an angelic way of life on earth. It joins a person together with heaven, makes them a fellow citizen to the angels. And then a little bit later, let no one say he is not able to keep himself chaste for faithful as God does not allow, allow us to be tempted beyond that, which uh, we are not able to bear, but will make provision for the temptation. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of temptations out there. Now, it's interesting, too, because what does chastity include? Does it mean, you know, just not having sex with anybody? Uh, that's the way a lot of people figure it. He says, avoiding any sort of uncleanness of body. So you could, you know, easily be unchaste, even if you're not screwing around with anybody, by indulging yourself in getting a massage every day when you don't actually need that massage, right? It, it has to do with the bodily desires, which include sexual desires, but also include a lot of other ones. What uh, Alcuin includes under the capital vice of lust is not just sexual actions. He also says, um, so it's avoiding uncleanness of body, especially unnatural ones, right? So things that that really go against our nature. And that could comprise, from his perspective, a whole bunch of different sexual acts, but again, could include other things as well. Um, you know, if you think about what this might encompass in terms of giving pleasure or comfort to the body. And, you know, he, he says that um, chastity is something that's necessary to all. Uh, most greatly to the ministers of Christ's altar, that is priests, monks, nuns. But he also says that there's scope for this within sexual relationships. He says you can have a legitimate spouse and that legitimate spouse can be used legitimately. Now he's actually talking about a man can have a wife because he's writing as a monk, a, a male monk, to uh, a, a male correspondent, right? The, the guy who he's writing this for. But we could easily, you know, make this reciprocal and extend it both ways. It's possible for a married couple, from Alcuin's point of view, to, to have chastity. It doesn't mean virginity. It doesn't mean never having sex. It means using our desires and pleasures and bodies in the right way. So these three, um, whatever we want to call them, you know, actions, modes of virtue, 
help to guide a person away from the three vices that we talked about, gluttony, lust, and greed, and towards a better understanding and a better relationship with their neighbor and with God.